that is spreading positivity around the world by sharing inspiring live experiences. I am thrilled to introduce our 101 guest for today's episode in the person of Phyllis Levitt, a retired psychotherapist of over 30 years and the author of America in Therapy. There's a lot to learn from today's episode, so sit tight and let's kick the ball rolling. Hello, Phyllis, and welcome to Podcast with Sheila. Hello, Sheila, and thank you so much for having me here today. It's an absolute delight. So in summary, who is Phyllis? Where does she come from? Just a little background story of who she is before we actually set it off. Sure. Yeah, I live in uh, Taos, New Mexico right now. I grew up in New Jersey uh, in the United States, and I became a psychotherapist when I was in my mid-30s after having done some very intensive therapy myself and seeing what a change it made in my in my life. And I had a practice for over 34 years, and now I'm focused on sharing what I have learned as a psychotherapist um, and the whole um, perspective of family dynamics and how they influence us for better or for worse and how we can heal some of the most uh, dangerous family dynamics in America today. Um, and really, they're dynamics that are happening all over the world. But I talk about America because this is where I live. Exactly. I can't wait to hear what unfolds in today's episode. What sparked your interest in healing childhood trauma and how did it influence your career as a psychotherapist? Yeah, you know, I was always drawn to working with children even before I realized that I had something to heal in my own childhood. So I think that's one of the ways that our unconscious sometimes directs us anyway, even if we're not aware in our in our present day mind but I always wanted to work with children I did a lot of work with children and then um, when I went to therapy myself I, I really began to remember traumas in my own childhood and and I saw how deeply they had affected how I felt about myself uh, many of the choices I made in relationship and in what I did with my time and who I, who were my friends and how I was raising my children um, and it just really opened such a world of understanding. And then pretty soon out of that, I realized that family dynamics happen on all levels, in our own families of origin, in our communities, in schools, on the playground, um, or in the classroom, in workplaces, in houses of worship. All groups operate on some kind of family dynamic. Those in charge, those who have to obey, or, you know, are the, are the dynamics constructive? Are they respectful of everyone? Do everyone's needs matter? Or is it just the people in charge whose needs matter? So these five, five family dynamics play out everywhere. And I began to see that they also play out in the highest reaches of government. And I just felt like I had to write about it. Wow. Can you share some of your childhood trauma experiences uh, with us? Um, let's highlight on it and let's try and draw some similarities to common ones you've also realized in today's world. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I guess what I would say is that for me, I was sexually abused when I was young and I had buried all of those memories. And so, but, but, the, the memory that something was painful and that something was wrong did not go away. I just didn't have the memory of what it was attributed to. Um, and I think a lot of people do that. Not everyone does that. I mean, a lot of people remember the traumas or the difficulties of their childhood. And it's not better or worse if you don't remember. But if you don't remember, then you have nothing to attach those feelings to except yourself. And so I just felt like I was a flawed human being and that there was something intrinsically wrong with me because I didn't know what had happened. Um, and I think that, so, so again, whether, and it produces symptoms. So for me, and there's many symptoms that, that childhood trauma produces in people and they're very varied. Um, not all, not n probably no two of us are alike exactly, but there are patterns that we've learned to identify as psychotherapists and also as a client, you kind of see your own patterns. My pattern was to become kind of reclusive, um, introverted and anxious and somewhat depressed. <laughs> and um, in a lot of ways, unable to be an advocate for myself. 
um, just didn't feel a lot of personal power, had a lot of self-doubt about who I was and my value and my worth. For many people, that's not the outcome. They become aggressive. They become addicted. They become, um, you know, driven to succeed at all costs. Um, so we have a, a wide variety of symptoms. Some people become obsessive. Some people become very rigid and dominating. And other people, a little bit more like myself, become somewhat passive and um, not, not, not having such a good voice for myself. And that really brought me to a place of crisis in my life where I knew that I needed to advocate for myself and I had to find that voice. Um, and that's actually what brought me to therapy uh, besides, you know, a lot of, you know, just sadness and, and just feeling like a mystery to myself. But once I remembered, and again, whether you remember always or you just recover your memories, um, it helps put the pieces of who you are back together in a very particular way, and I'll just say it real briefly, and that is that we, we take on certain beliefs about ourselves, depending on how we're treated by other people. And when people are loved, and they feel like they belong, and they're safe, and they're provided for, and when conflict is dealt with in a respectful and nonviolent way, we become emotionally healthy human beings who tend to treat other people the same way. And if we haven't been treated that way, the chances that we will either become aggressive ourselves and dominating or passive and easily controlled, those two outcomes are very likely for many people. And I see those two outcomes kind of mushrooming in America and around the world, where more and more people become highly dominating and aggressive themselves, and other people are e easily controlled or dominated or bought off um, um, and become passive, even in regard to their own welfare. So this is a dangerous family dynamic that you know I, I saw up close and personal for myself and with many clients that I worked with, and then saw that on the mega scale of our larger communities. I totally agree with you, as even in the lives of grown-ups, depending on wherever community or whatever community you find yourself in, sometimes you can feel a bit pressured or suppressed, or you can be in a negative environment that have a, an adverse effect on your life. And as grown-ups, or even, I, I don't know, as a child, but as grown-ups, you don't even see it, that it's having a negative impact on you. But as you're talking about it now, I'm beginning to identify with a few things myself because mm. as growing up, yeah, as growing up, I lived a very shielded life. My parents shielded us a lot. So growing up, getting married, coming out, trying to live an independent life of my own, raising my children, I've had to learn so many things firsthand and I've made a lot of mistakes. I've fallen into, I wouldn't say the wrong company, but I've, I met people because I thought that at the back of my mind if you've not harmed anybody nobody has a right to harm you and that was my concept as i grew up only to realize that sometimes you don't need have to do anything bad to somebody for them to do something bad to you so i've had different forms of shocks as right. i've been growing up and for that right. reason i've built a wall around me a very high wall because mm. i'm thinking no i'm not going to allow this to happen to me anymore I'm not going to allow this to happen to me anymore. And I'm not interested in making friends. Mm. Uh, yeah, I'm not interested in making friends. And as you talked, you kept talking, I found my, I, I'd rather put my time, my energy into raising my children, into working a lot, into getting on projects, just so that I wouldn't find myself amongst people. I have a very close social set, very, very close. And as you were talking about it, I was just picking them up. But I feel safe that way. Right. Yeah. Um, well, the mm -hmm. truth is we all need to feel safe. In yeah. order to be emotionally and mentally healthy and exactly. well, the bottom line is we have to be safe. Because when people aren't safe, they develop defenses. Yeah. And, and that's what we do. That's just human nature. That's not a flaw. We try to defend against harm. We try to defend against attack or being maligned or being excluded and rejected or uh, seen as inferior or whatever the attack is, whether it's physical, sexual, or mental and emotional. And so 
in order for people to be safe, to actually connect with each other and relate and be safe for one another, we have to be safe or we have to have developed defenses that are actually functional. And for most of us who were harmed by other people, the, de the defenses that we develop are not necessarily functional. They may work in the moment, like shutting down, building a wall, um, drinking too much to numb out the pain or becoming driven work-wise so that I don't let any other impressions in. I'm just on a track and the train keeps moving and I don't feel. Um, but usually what happens for people and what often brings people to therapy is that their defenses actually aren't working so well. Um, you know, sometimes when people build a wall, and it sounds like you have a community now around you, but often when people have a wall um, that is designed to keep them safe, for instance, they may feel safe behind that wall, but they also suffer from being terribly alone because we're wired for love and connection. We need other people. We need a positive reflection. We need to feel like we matter or that we have value among people. And so often the defenses that we create in the end break down. And the same thing can be said for a country. Look at our defense structure. Look at what we've done with police brutality, so-called to defend or protect. Um, look at we've, what we've done with investing billions of dollars in weapons of mass destruction that kill, that kill more and more people. So these are our defenses as a country. And do they work? Maybe for the people who profit from them, but not for anybody else. Yeah. And so I think we really have to re-examine that whole structure um, and take apart what we're looking at as defense and really ask ourselves, how do we make it safe here so that we don't need these defenses? And that actually means our commitment to many, many segments of our population who here in the United States are not safe here now, as well as other countries who, you know, are receiving arms from us. Um, and again, there's no easy answer. Sometimes war seems justified. I get that. I get that we live in fear of being attacked or that, you know, we're afraid of being taken over by someone else. I get the fear. But who's going to start the peace movement? Because if we act on that fear, we could destroy life as we know it for all of us. Yeah. You're absolutely right. Can you share a key insight or experience from one of your books that had a profound impact on your own healing journey? Yeah, let me think about what that would be. Um, I guess I guess what I would say, and there's probably a number of them, um, but the one that really comes to mind is that when I was in my mid-30s, I had three little children and I was in a very dysfunctional marriage. Um, you know, which was understandable. I mean, I was attracted to someone who wasn't particularly healthy for me because I wasn't particularly healthy. You know, my, my, um, my trauma was still just beginning to be unearthed. So um, what really happened was that I hit bottom. I just hit a place of such deep depression and such deep feelings of being at a loss of how to manage my life. And I felt I, I really suffered from massive anxiety at that time. And I think it was these memories trying to bubble up and come to consciousness. And they produced a lot, a lot, a lot of anxiety that was very hard to live with. And at one point, I really felt like I didn't want to live anymore. I didn't have any plan to commit suicide and I would never have done it because I loved my children too much and I would never have left them. So it was a very hard place to be where I didn't really want to be alive, but there was no exit. And it, that's what drove me to get help and start talking to another person who was trained to, you know, to deal with emotional um, and family dynamics issues. And it was a process of uncovering and restoring. It, it took a while for me to plow through some of the deepest pain and come out the other side, but I cannot tell you how worth it was. It was worth everything. Um, and, and that's really what fueled my desire to be a psychotherapist. And I think that happens for so many people that if something really helps us and changes our lives, we just want to share it with other yeah. people. 
It's just a natural human impulse to give what we have received. Exactly, because there's a lot going on in the world today, especially in the family settings, in marriages and all of that. And sometimes for me, I think that if you're able to navigate out of some of these struggles is worth sharing. And that is why podcast we realize here to share some of these stories so that somebody can hear your story and can say, if you were able to do it, then I can do it. So, so that's a brilliant thing to do. Let's talk about America in therapy. How do you envision bringing the healing process you outlined in America in therapy to a national scale? Yeah, I mean, there's many ways. And I try to like sort of go into in my book how I, through the family therapy lens, how I see what isn't working in the family of America and why isn't it, it isn't working and what results it's producing. Just like if you have abuse or neglect in a family, a single family, the people who are impacted by the abuse and neglect are going to become symptomatic. They're going to have some way that their pain gets expressed. And we've talked about what some of those are. Um, people become symptomatic and without help, the, then the, their symptoms get passed down from one generation to another. So the way I see America in therapy um, and what I would like to bring to, Mer to America and really to people all over the world. Um, so it's, it's not just confined to America, but are some of the basic principles of the best healing that I know through the world of psychology. And some of those start with that we, we have to understand what conditioned us. We have to understand the roots of America, our history, who came here. Many of the people who settled here came from massive trauma from religious persecution, from economic poverty, from wars, from being incarcerated. And then over the years, many of the people who came through Ellis Island and, you know, were greeted by the Statue of Liberty were immigrants from other countries, many other countries fleeing poverty and persecution and war. So we have lots of trauma in our past. And one of the things that therapy makes it safe for people, individual people to do, is to really go into that pain of what happened to them and try to peel back the layers of that early conditioning, if it's, a, if it's our own lives or a country, and find their essential self that's buried underneath the level, the layers of pain and harmful messages they've received and coping mechanisms that they've developed to defend and protect themselves that aren't working. And the same lens can be applied to a country. And part of that, and this is something that, you know, a lot of times people don't talk about, but I want to talk about because I feel like it's so important. And that is, in the best therapy, we not only feel safe to go into the pain of what happened to us and rework it, but we also feel we create a safe environment and I, for people to feel that they can talk about also the things that they've done that have hurt other people. Because most of us have hurt other people, not just been hurt ourselves. And the more we're hurt ourselves, the more likely we are, just because it's the way human nature is, not because we're bad people at, in heart, in our hearts, um, to reenact some of what has happened to us in some form. And so we, we therapy, the best therapy for a person or for a country is to make it safe and to actually make it something that we celebrate, that we can own our own missteps. We can own what we did to Native American people when we came here. We can own what we did to the black people we brought over and enslaved and are still persecuting. And we can own what we do to women. And we, we can own what we do to the poor. Um, and look that in the face and commit to healing our own missteps and not just the wounds that we have inflicted. And that's really, I think, the essence of what good therapy does. And when I say make it safe, it means we're not just looking to criminalize people or see them as the worst thing that the, has ever happened to them or the worst thing that they've ever done, but we see beyond them to their essential self. And I can tell you from my own personal experience, the first experience I had in my entire life of feeling 
and it wasn't a therapist, but someone who, that I had an experience with someone who I felt actually saw me through my shutdown, through my fears, through my, you know, the places where I wasn't thriving, that changed my life. To feel seen for my essence changed my life. And it was the beginning of my healing journey, even though it took me many years to actually get into therapy. Um, and we can do that for one another. There is an essential, beautiful self that was born inside every human being. And the more we see that and reflect that back to one another and feed that to each other with respect, with care, with safety, with a commitment to nonviolent conflict resolution, to providing for each other, to cooperating with each other, through celebrating diversity rather than, you know, judging it. Um, all these ways are ways that we actually bring to life, you know, spark the flame inside someone that's already there for them to become their most beautiful essential self who will be safe for other human beings and a contribution to the whole. So in summary, are we then saying that um, if somebody is not treating you well, is because they themselves don't feel good within, so then they don't have anything good to offer or then they can't love you or treat you well because they feel by themselves they are not even being loved or they don't feel love within in I some way. I think that is a really good um, conclusion and it's part of what I talk about and it's an important one. The person may not be aware that they don't feel good about themselves because often people who have had, had um, kind of dominating role models, like this is what you do. You dominate people to win the argument, to get what you want from them. Um, and to be, you know, to come out on top. Many people have that role model for them as just the way you're supposed to be. And that's how you succeed. So they wouldn't necessarily tell you that they don't feel good about themselves. But what I have found from years of working with hundreds and hundreds of people is that what you're saying is actually true. That inside, somewhere inside, either conscious or unconscious, are experiences and perceptions of self that a person has taken on that are not positive. And they're also trying to survive the best they can, sometimes in very, very dangerous ways. Um, so I'll say this in a nutshell, that what I have found as a psychotherapist that I think many people really don't realize today, and we need to realize if we want to interrupt the cycle of abuse and neglect on a society level, as well as in an individual family level, is that inside the perpetrator is a victim that is unhealed. And I really believe that bringing America to therapy means that we start to look at people that way. We start to re totally revamp, for instance, our criminal justice system to be oriented toward helping people really heal from the traumas that set them up to act out in the first place. Um, we may not be able to do that with every single person, but that can be where we invest our money rather than in just building more prisons, which is a horrible way to deal with what we're doing. Exactly. And some, of, and some of the, you know, just, the, just to answer that question, what does it mean to bring America to therapy? So it means that we can look at what's happened to us that we're reacting to, but we also take responsibility for what we've done to hurt masses of people within our own country as well as around the world and take responsibility for that. I would say one of the key elements of the best psychotherapy is that we learn to take responsibility for ourselves and not keep pointing the finger of blame at other people, um, no matter what they've done. And people have done terrible things. But if we take responsibility for ourselves, that's how we break the cycle. And part of that, and I, I love to say this because, because I think it, it wouldn't, it's not that far-fetched, but it may be. <laughs> and that is that I would love to see in the upper reaches of government, Congress, for instance, um, that we have a commitment to actually speak to one another when we're in disagreement with respect, with some kind of openness to a different point of view, and 
bottom line with a desire to come to some agreement that is in the best interest of everyone. Because we know in an individual family, if the parents are hostile to one another and they're fighting all the time and they're slamming doors or they're walking out or they're saying horrible things about each other to their children, that the children suffer and they become symptomatic from that. And we have that going on in our country and I think probably many countries around the world where those in positions of power are in fierce, hostile, open opposition to one another and not listening, not showing any kind of respect for one another, spreading sometimes many untruths about one another, threatening, you know, violence toward one another. And this is affecting the mental health and well-being of our entire country. And I think it's happening all over the world. And so I would love... Mm-hmm. I'm just going to say real quick. So I would love to see there be trained facilitators in Congress who actually help people, direct people to listen just the way we do with an angry couple who comes to therapy. We teach them how to be safe, how to communicate in ways that are respectful, how to leave their violence outside the door. Um, because the agenda is that they reconnect and form a healthy alliance. And that is what we need in our country, that the object of all, and there can be disagreement. We will all probably always have conflict and different opinions about how to do things. But if the goal is to reconnect and repair the rifts in our relationships, imagine what the role model would be for the rest of the country and how that would, how that would ease everyone's minds here. Thank you very much. Somebody is popping up some love hearts for us. So thank you very much, whoever is doing that. What do you mean by bridging the gap between love and politics and how can this be done? Absolutely, yeah. Um, what I'll, In a nutshell, what I have found as a therapist of over 30 years and certainly as a client myself and as a person in this world is that love and belonging are the best food for human beings. When we are loved and we feel like we safely belong to others, we are safe for other people. Because when you feel like you, you, you're you loved and you belong, you want to take care of the people that are loving you and including you, just the way they're taking care of you and loving you. And so um, when we don't have that, we become symptomatic. It's, it's that simple. And it's curious to me, not surprising in many ways, because I do understand our collective psychology through the lens of everything that I've worked with, that love is never talked about in politics. It's not on the agenda. Love and belonging are not on the agenda. And the people, the few people who do talk about that, who run for office, don't get anywhere. <laughs> um, And part of that is because there's such an investment in partisanship. There's such an investment in in differing ideologies that support one group against another. And as long as we're in that mindset that somebody has to win instead of we all have to win, we're going to keep on with the partisan politics and love won't be part of the agenda. But I'm going to come back and say that love and belonging and the safety that that brings are what make people thrive and become their most, their best selves and their safest selves and their most contributing selves. Sometimes I think to myself, you know, it could be that person in Gaza who got bombed in their apartment building who might have been the first person to cure cancer, but they never got the chance because we're so invested in war. Yeah. You're, you're absolutely right. So we, we, we cut their lives short even before they were able to blow up in their peppers whilst they are here on earth. Because they were, I'm sorry, I didn't understand quite what you said. Could you say that again? So because the person was killed in a war 
uh, they weren't able to live their purpose because probably they had the cure for cancer, right. but they were cut off, right. so they couldn't live. To it, that's so true, and these are some of the things I think we we all have to think of as human beings in a very small way, even not as a well as as a collective people in the world, but yeah. in our very special ways. We should know that whatever harm we are causing to the next person is not just affecting that person; might be affecting a whole number of people down the line because if that person had a cure for cancer and we cut them off someone else who would have had that healing missed it because mm -hmm. the person who had the cure mm -hmm. so it's not just taking one person out when we think we take someone off we are taking the whole line of generation the whole line of people and this is something yeah. we have to think about and process before we we take a move or we make the next decision or action that is going it's, to cause it's so true it's so true and it, what you're saying is really why there is intergenerational abuse and neglect because when it doesn't get stopped for many people it gets passed down yeah. and it just perpetuates itself and yeah. just like in the body i use the medical model a lot because i think it really applies in the body if you have a severe symptom and it doesn't get treated it will create other symptoms yeah and it could kill you yeah. so taking taking us back to our roots of our formative experiences and reworking them that's what that's what the best psychotherapy does even if you have had trauma in your childhood even if you've been molested or you've been beaten or you've been ostracized in your community or or you were so poor that you didn't have enough to eat and that created symptoms whatever it was the best psychotherapy can help break the cycle of abuse in you and restore you to your most essential, loving, beautiful self. Is it perfect? No. You know, no, no, I probably know human science is perfect, but we don't need perfection. We just need to be on that road with one another and do the very best we can to heal ourselves, help others heal. And then when we fall back into our old patterns, we have some tools to bring us back into loving connection with ourselves and other people. Wow. The future generations, how can we ensure that our approaches to national healing benefits future generations? Well, I think that there's no way that it wouldn't benefit future generations. There are so many children now living in poverty in the United States. There are so many children growing up in neighborhoods where they're not safe ever. Um, there are so many people who don't have access to good education or medical care or good housing. Um, so if we, if, so this is how I say it. I say, I say, I'll repeat what I said before. Love and belonging are the best food for human beings. And if we were living that principle, and this is the way I say the principle, and it's nothing new. We've all heard it before. We just don't enact it as national policy that I wouldn't want to do to another person anything that I wouldn't want them to do to me. Bottom line, that is love in politics. Yeah. Mm. That is the best medicine for the survival of the human race. And so if we were, if we were electing people who were living by these principles, if we become more of those people in our own lives, even if we just have a small circle of people that we interact with and affect, we are spreading that, those seeds for future generations. All children that grow up in an environment where they're loved and they feel like they're wanted and belong and are valued for just who they are and they don't have to become somebody else. Those children are going to grow up to be peace, safeful, peace, peace, peaceful, safe, and loving human beings to the best of their ability in a very complex world. Wow. What is your message of hope to listeners who may feel overwhelmed by the challenges we face daily? Yeah, and I, I love that question because so many people today feel like there's nothing I can do. This is just out of my hands. These forces are too big. You know, maybe the human race is just going down. And maybe it is. I hope not. I love people. I love my children. I love my grandchildren. I feel great love for humanity. I feel sad. I mean, I feel beyond sad, like so many of us, when I hear of yet another war and how many thousands of innocent people are dying. And I can feel helpless and powerless. 
So what I'm here to say is you do not have to be a therapist to be helpful. Great if you are, great if you can find one, great if you can afford one in today's society. And that's another thing that I would love to see for America in therapy is that the healing arts are nationally funded for all people so that it's not a matter of economics of whether you can get help or not. Um, but what I would say is that, um, that the hope is that we can each become more loving and kind ourselves. We can each take more and more responsibility for my own, for our own behavior. So if I'm mad at you and you're mad at me and we're, you know, sort of at it, can I be responsible for how I interact with you, even if I don't like the way you're talking to me? And I don't mean you personally, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, but can yeah. I become responsible? Can I be the one who goes first to be more generous in my understanding of where your pain might lie? Or can I be the one who goes first to say, please let's lower our voices. I want to reconnect with you. I'm angry at you right now because of X, but is there something I'm not hearing? Or can I just, you know, not roll my eyes at you or raise my voice at you or turn that way when you're talking. You know, there's always a way that we can become more, more responsible for ourselves. And I had a, um, a, an instructor in graduate school in a class on couples therapy. And the one thing that he said that I've never forgotten was, he said, the couples in my experience who do the best are those who focus on their own responsibility in changing their relationship and they don't keep pointing the finger at their partner. And I have found that to be true. And I think that's true on the smallest levels of our own relationships. And it's true for us as a country. Can we take responsibility for ourselves and stop blaming other people? Mm, I can't agree with you any less. What would your final message be to our listeners as we wrap up? Yeah. So if you're hurting, find someone and get your own help, do your own healing and free up that essential self in you so that you can be more happy and more filled and more a feeling like you belong, have a feeling that you belong and are a contributing member. So don't be ashamed. Don't be afraid. Seeking help is not a sign of weakness. It's actually a sign of strength and courage to become vulnerable and dive into your pain and retrieve your best self so you can be that in the world. And then, and then you know, and that, that may not be what you need to do. Um, maybe you're in a good place in your life. Share. Be that, that person who reflects other people's goodness, other people's talents, other people's strengths. And know that everything you give, we're all going to get back in equal measure, if not more so. And just to know... Um, that just by smiling at someone, just by being friendly to someone who you might have ignored or, you know, not paid attention to, just by being friendly and acknowledging them, that ripple effect of love, you don't know where it goes. It might go, they might take that home to their children and be in a better mood or to their coworkers, or maybe they were thinking of offing themselves that morning and your kindness brought them back from the ledge of their own despair. We can all make a difference. Wow. As we draw this inspiring conversation to a close, we would like to say a massive thank you, Phyllis, for coming on podcast with Sheila today. Thank you for having me. I, it's just such an honor. You're a wonderful podcast host. Um, I can tell that you really want to make a difference in the world. And I really um, appreciate that you had me on today so I could share, you know, the way that I want to contribute. Definitely, most definitely. I saw quite a number of people come up on live and I've seen a few people leave hi and laughs both on um, YouTube and Instagram. So would like to say thank you very much to our live audience. And we believe today's episode is going to inspire many. But remember, in every challenge lies an opportunity for growth and with determination and resilience, we can turn our dreams into reality. Until we meet again, keep spreading positivity and chasing your dreams. Thank you. Thank you. And please, if it's okay with you, I'd just like to say my book is available, America in Therapy, from all the major booksellers. Please look for me online, um, www.phyllislevitt.com. 
I'm on Instagram and LinkedIn and YouTube and Facebook and, you know, all the things. And I, anyone who wants to make contact with me, I'm totally open to communicating and sharing more. So thank you so much.